And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always, I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. Hello, hello. Do 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 Yes, we are. It is the final segment of Heavens and Heresies tonight. We After... can blame his off-key singing as as being uh, legally distinct. Yes, which means I, which means sorry, Europe, you're not get. You're not getting you're not getting fifty thousand from from me. <laughs> you're what? Well, you're not aware of that story? Oh, I am. That's why I'm laughing. Yeah, seriously, what the fuck, Europe? You want you wanted fifty thousand per play for the for the use of Final Countdown. Hmm. But yeah, final segment of uh of this Valley of the Judged. Of course, this doesn't mean this is the end of Valley of the Judged, just a season finale, I guess. Well, we're coming out of this valley. We're finally at the other end, but there are many valleys to judge ahead. Yeah. And we for the, I'd say for the most part, we have mainly been tackling the player facing end of Heavens and Heresies. For this final one, we are tackling a more GM-facing affair with what's known as the Encountuary, which is, I'd say, a far better name than Monster Manual for y for your um, bestiary. Or GM's Guide for your, well, your GM's Guide. Mm. <laughs> now, as is, the, as is the tradition in these things... I did end up asking, because of the fact that Encounter deals with, well, encounters, I did ask Tanner um, his take on 5e's monster slash encounter design and how he'd address it. And here's what he had to say, quote, So good DMs will be able to put together good encounters with 5e's bestiary, but that's from experience rather than from the bestiary itself, and more importantly, they tend to ignore 5e's CR system when they do so. I think that's relatively old news, though. So for me, I want D I want GMs to have an easier time putting together encounters with Heavens and Heresies, and interesting ones at that. So the Encounterary is a GM's guide that aims to do that. Help GMs put together encounters, then adventures, a string of encounters, and campaigns, a string of adventures. It will have a lot of sample encounters in addition to a full guide on how to put them together when it's finished, which is far from being at the moment. There are lots of odds and ends that the encounter addresses, so it's hard to list them all, but rather than doing CR by individual creature, it does so by encounter and has ways to create bigger, stronger creatures and lesser, smaller creatures within that system, and also takes into consideration terrain and environmental effects and other such things. It also has a functional GM's guide, helping GMs make games that are interesting and helping them adjudicate actions in ways that make the game fun and dynamic and whatnot. Um, while it might be old news, I do want to address the return of challenge rating that D&D 5th Edition brought. Now, one could argue that I'm biased, but I was never a fan of challenge rating bet when it was introduced in 3rd Edition. Now, some, now the, argument, the argument against challenge rating that a lot of people have had is that, is that it ended up removing the spontaneity the spontaneity of enc of encounters or the or the or in some cases people saying that it that it brought in the idea that encounters have to be balanced this idea this idea that somehow encounters are be are better when they're not balanced um no the problem that i had with the crit with the challenge rating system is the fact that it relies on some very damning assumptions the idea is that that is that that should be the that should be the average level for a party of four 
characters, except it is assuming a party of four optimized characters. And you know what they say about assuming. Makes an ass out of you and me. And this is it's for this it's for this reason that whenever you try whenever you try and do non standard builds or do or um rely or rely on a set of classes that aren't the big four and you and still try and put in this whole challenge rating thing, it doesn't end up working. Which is which is why I thought I thought that fourth edition's um, approach to get rid of to get rid of the thing, and instead go with a XP budget approach, which is something that Fantasy Craft also does, but but in a different manner, was a was a net was a smart move. Because especially since in each um each entry there would be a there would be a suggested layout of how of how many bigger ones and how many minions. Of a certain creature type, <coughs> as well as well as again an XP budget to try and to try and balance things out, as well as a set of rolls for monsters. Mm -hmm. Of course, the most the most obvious role in this kind of thing is solo, which I think is self-explanatory. Yeah, and. They don't, and 4E also brought in the whole idea of of the minion type encounter, which is bas basically is a is just a one HP affair. One hit, they're gone. You know, for for when you needed the mooks. Now, 5E has the as of course the other issue of assuming that that a session is going to use a certain amount of encounters. I think I think it was like I think it was like. Um, like four four encounters a session, except you can't really assume that people are going to be running a certain number of combat encounters. Yeah, could go more, could go less, could uh, could not hit any encounter uh, combat encounters at all if uh, your players play in a specific fashion. It also me that assumption also means that it that'd be impossible to use that with say hex crawls or even some dungeon crawls. Oh, dungeon crawls you you'd never be able to do just four encounters per session. Mm -hmm. Dungeon crawls are meat grinders. Yeah. And this and when it comes to when it comes to hex crawls, you could get a bunch of encounters or you could get long stretches of none of them. It depends on where the dice gods lay that day. Yep. So with the so with that said, let's have a look. Let's have a look at what at what he's got at what he's got planned, and I will no, I will note that afterwards we will be giving our fi our final assessments on heavens and heresies. Although as although as far as the grading, I think I think it I think it'll be pretty obvious by the end of this where where the grade for heavens and heresies is. <laughs> No, monk. It's not obvious at all. Not not. Well, it might not be for obvious for anyone jumping in right now. That's about all I can say. If you're jumping in right now, my sympathies. <laughs> but so at at the very top, we have a dev note. The encounter area is what I use as the GM's handbook and bestiary. CR in other games is flimsy and generally doesn't help build encounters since terrain and other such elements will make certain encounters much harder than others, even though the CR of those encounters might be equal in those games. For the most part, I'm the forever GM, so this section hasn't really been necessary. I'm trying to fill it out to give an example to people of what it will do slash look like. Rather than putting fixed things, I'm also putting little summaries of what will be in each section, since I am one person and this will be a whole 120-page book or so. That's cute, thinking you'll only be 120 pages. I think he's already beyond that with most of what we've seen and what we'll expand upon. Yeah. Incid incidentally, pro um, Tanner, a bit of a, a bit of an advice from an old pro: never assume that your that your book is gonna be 
at at a certain page count because it will always be more. Ah, uh, your binder books. <laughs> Also, a lot, a lot of this is notes to myself. Um, I feel like I feel like that's a grammar error. No, no, it, no, it's it isn't. it's correctly it's correctly parsed. It's just a weird sentence because yeah. you know English is fucked. He goes. I reference Angry a lot, aka the Angry GM, a blog writer who I respect for his gaming advice since it's generally grounded, helpful, and based on experience. Also, all the information that is here isn't organized yet. I'll organize it better in later versions. This section aims to show GMs how to craft encounters, adventures, and campaigns in that order. An adventure is treated as a series of encounters, and a campaign is treated as a series of adventures. Logical. And he goes, section explaining what a GM is to people, what the actual role of a GM is, some sec section about adjudicating options, then encounters, then adventures, then campaigns. Then we, and then we go with the most important thing. Oh, it's been a while since we saw that phrase. Mm. Going dev note, something like this will be in the player's handbook as well. Wait a minute, hold on. Let me let me let me go see if that actually is. The, this is. Like. Um, it was in the. In, there was a most important thing in the introduction, but this is not the same most important thing. Uh, yep. Yep. That is true, but uh, to, to reference, just remember that the most important thing in the introduction was the most important thing is to have fun. That's it. This is a game. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing in the encounter. Yep. The most important thing, more important than mechanics or narrative, is to know the people whom you'll be running a game. Jesus, it's, not, it's, not, it's almost like I said. It's almost like I said that two weeks ago. It's, al <laughs> it's almost like we're all forever GMs here, and we understand that the most important part of running a game is knowing your audience. That's just some. That's just something that you should know when it when it comes to doing any sort of performance. Monk, not everyone can be performers. Throw them on. Throw them on stage. They got to learn somehow. <laughs> But you may re you may recall when I did that musing the role playing bubble and I brought I brought up that because I, br I brought up the fact that trying to trying trying to pick a certain game as ideal for newcomers is folly. Yeah, because you never know who you're what type of audience a newcomer is. You need to cater to the to those newcomers. Mm hmm. Anyway, well, for well, for for me, it's more of if you're ru if you're running a game if you're running a game in a room full of weebs, why why are you why are you breaking out your why are you breaking out your copy of Ravenloft? Break out a copy of Ten Rabancho Zero and really scare the weebs. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Running a tabletop game is a lot like making a meal for a group of people. You can spend all the love and attention you want to make your perfect meal, but if it doesn't fit the palate of the people at your table, then they're not going to enjoy the meal, which is the whole point. The point is not for them to say, IT'S FUCKING RAW! <laughs> WHAT ARE YOU?! <laughs> I am not an idiot sandwich. I wasn't asking you. <laughs> Is asking our hypothetical, not a, not appealing to the audience person here. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean you've made a bad meal, but it does mean that you've made that you that you haven't made the meal that is good for the people at your table. You need to know their tastes, their likes, dislikes, etc. A lot of that will come with time and effort. If you put effort into figuring out what your table likes and make those things, then the experience will be better overall. Now, keeping with the food analogy, this does not mean that you should serve dessert for every course. Sometimes, in order to have a truly amazing experience, people need to feel as if they have earned it. They need to be forced to eat their veggies so they will appreciate the dessert more. I take offense to that. Veggies are delicious if you know how to do it. Veggies are very delicious. There are some very nice uh, intricacies to both preparing and, uh, 
and seasoning veggies that makes them super good. Well, except for Brussels sprouts. They can go fuck off. We shall not talk about the heinous tiny balls. They need to go die in a hole. Either that or be, either that or be used as ammo for a potato gun. Speaking from experience. That's insulting to potatoes, though. <laughs> well, some people call it an apple gun, if that helps. Why would you waste good apples? I wouldn't. I good. waste good Brussels sprouts. You know, There's no such thing. It's the easiest kind of improvised grape shot. <laughs> I was about to say, though, there's no such thing as good Brussels sprouts. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but it goes, this is true in tabletop RPGs as well. Some, sometimes doing only what your players want will not create a good experience. Often they need to feel they, that they've earned their dessert. It's a fine line and one that will differ from person to person. As the GM of the game, it's your job to discover this line in order to create fantastical adventures for your group. One group's epic adventure is another group's boring slog. You want to know what the best and worst anal analogy when it comes to the um, GM and player relationship that one that one of my old friends had, so had told me? What's that? The re it's like the relationship between the d between the dom and the sub. <laughs> I am. Um... Hold on, let me think about that for a second. Your friend isn't wrong, considering <laughs> as as someone who's been in that lifestyle, your friend is not wrong. <laughs> I have, I have, fr I have, pl I have my fair. Sh I've never dipped into that pond myself, but I have friends who have, and they have echoed that sentiment. As the forever dom, I no, that's that's painfully accurate in some ways. Mm -hmm. Forever GM, forever dom. Is there a pattern? <laughs> uh, mm. uh, anywho, yeah. uh, m my my favorite thing here when when. <laughs> When he said one group's epic adventure is another group's boring slog, reminds me of some tables I was playing at when I was living in a it was essentially a giant, uh, like it was a house owned by a guy who was just kind of renting out every room to some of his friends. Mm -hmm. And and as a DM, every one of his campaigns, meat grinder, every one of them got old real quick. It also never went beyond like two or three sessions before he wanted to switch to a new system within D&D 3.5 and a new campaign that was still a meat grinder within D&D 3.5. Did I ever tell you, you the definition of insanity? No, Voss. No, I don't think you did. Because <laughs> that's what I'm here... There are two. There are two things I'm hearing. One is one is that the other. It, the other is the gag of. If what if you look in if you look in the if you look in the dictionary for the definition of an idiot, what do you find? A picture of me? No, you find the definition of an idiot, which you fucking are. <laughs> well, uh, the the way I always described him, uh, this guy. Love the guy to death. Cool guy, but um, as DM, he left me uh, unfinished and unsatisfied, much like my third ex-girlfriend. <laughs> anyway, we move on to respecting player agency. Give players things to do and choose between. Give them stuff to interact with. You can't do this if you don't know what your players can do, meaning that, as a GM, you need to know what your players are capable of mechanically and what their narrative tendencies are. Again, know your group. If players come up with a unique way to solve an encounter, let them solve it. The sorcerer wants to burn down the wooden door in front of them, let them burn it down. If you can't let your players outthink you without being upset, you shouldn't be a GM. Yes! Say it louder for those in the back! I cannot it tell you how many how many times we how many times we that um that that certain GMs I had to put up with would put in class specific obstacles that we didn't that we didn't have access to and thus we had to do it with a bunch of then we we had a bunch we had to overcome with a bunch of penalties 
Like if you're telling us that we're doing a war story, don't ha don't put don't put a bunch of locked doors in front of us. Unless you happen to be doing some sort of war story where you're, you know, intelligence agents. But that's, again, very specific and very stupid. <laughs> we were supposed to be crusaders. I know. Monk, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I have never once in my career as a DM or a GM or any of those other M's, the master of the gaming types, uh... I have never once resented my players for coming with uh, ingenious or off the wall or out of left field or completely batshit solutions to problems. I let them try it. I let them roll the fucking dice and let the let it go where it may lie. This has resulted in some of those probably you know those best table moments where every fucking person's hanging their breath on that one die roll you get that that kick-ass feeling of sweet sweet dopamine and euphoria and everybody's jumping and cheering at that die roll that has happened at my tables because i'm willing to let everybody play the fucking game <laughs> just do it do the thing roll your dice see what happens mm -hmm. the only time things are otherwise impossible are things that i won't even like, like if it if it's something that is intentionally impossible due to whatever circumstance makes it impossible such as an indestructible MacGuffin, um then i just say you know i won't even allow a dice roll at that point because it is impossible now with that in with that in mind, there's one final part in player agency. A note from Angry. If the players don't think they have options, the choice doesn't count as a, as a decision point. And he goes, things not included in the encounter. Specific lists of creature types and whatnot. These are going to be in the setting handbook. It won't be called that. Which will go over the lore for a, of a specific setting. This game will use Mirari as the sample setting in the setting handbook, which will contain various creature types along with common passive and active features attributed to those creature types, stuff like that. A blend of narrative and mechanical stuff. There will be simple creatures and encounters, of course, but only to demonstrate how... Hang on, your, um, your cursor is in the way. I can't see the text. Oh, I, uh... Only to demonstrate how creatures and encounters are made with the tools that will be found in this book. Specific stuff related to the setting will be found in the setting handbook. World building stuff a la how to build a world will probably be included in the setting handbook as well rather than here. The core ideas for encounters. Encounters are set up differently in Heavens and Heresies. Um, Heavens and Heresies refers to encounters rather than combat. Encounters might have creatures which you fight, but they might not. Smart. Rather than having the same stat block for every type of encounter, it utilizes different stat blocks for different types of encounters. For example, if in an encounter where endless gremlins crawl from the crevices of the cave, forcing the adventurers to escape, imagine... Sorry, ha I, the imagine thing was my, was my thing. Having a stat block for every gremlin would not make for an easy-to-run game. Or if a party faces a colossal dragon, having a single stat block and only allowing the dragon to act once in the initiative order or not show signs of weakening or not change its strategy due to damage can lead to a mundane, static encounter. In addition, the, the composition of a party will greatly determine what kinds of encounters are challenging and fun. Compared to an adventuring party made entirely of barbarians, an adventuring party made entirely of rogues will find some encounters trivial and others extremely deadly. Party composition, then, should aid the GM in evaluating the difficulty of encounters. Beyond that, it should also signal to them what would be fun for their group to experience. In simple terms, every encounter should challenge some members of the party while allowing others to shine. Or, in the case of a group of rogues, certain en encounters should remind them of the limitations of rogues, while others highlight the strength of rogues. Choosing which conflict to resolve, or choosing how to resolve a particular conflict... Angry calls these mazes versus obstacle courses. 
as well as talking about puzzles, one right answer, and a problem, something with multiple answers. Which it is a is a fair bit is a um fair bit because I'm pretty I'm pretty sure we've I'm pretty sure you you as well as I you dealt with this as well as much as I have. Those types of encounters where it's very clearly meant for one particular archetype. I try to limit those encounters, but if I'm playing a module my players want to play, those encounters will occur. It's lar it's largely because of the it's largely because of the fact that those particular those particular encounters and those particular uh, modules are are um in, are within that or within that particular trap. Yeah. Um, in the end, I, I try not to design a a trap to be specific to one set of skills, or or a puzzle, or or a problem, or any of these different uh, t terms that uh, Tanner's using. I don't. I try not to design the overarching uh, interactions to be limited to one skill set. Uh, as, as he points out with the encounters uh, challenging some members of the party while allowing others to excel, that, that is something that plays to strengths and might pun and well, not necessarily looking to actually punish, because punishment uh, implies intentionally trying to hobble. But mm -hmm. while trying, you know, allowing some people to excel and shine while trying to help others push past their limitations is a great way to try and play the game. Or, in the case of being the GM, try and run the game so that all of your players feel like they are warranted and feel like they're involved. Mm -hmm. No one likes to feel like a spare wheel. That's also why I've seen I've seen some people are I've seen some people argue the role pl the role playing value in in um gimped builds. I I have I have always argued that 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 um while you while you can make fun with that that's the same thing that's the same thing as the fallacy of a game being fun with friends. It's not to say a game can't be fun with friends, but it's a very low, but it's a very low, low, low bar. Yeah, I mean, making a gimped build because you think it would make for an interesting roleplay character <clears throat> is one thing. Uh, making a gimped build because you think that it would also uh, make for mechanical interest kind of seems like cutting off your nose to spite your face. There's there's, all, there's, all, there's also the fact that when you do when you do that kind when you do that kind of build you are if um, depend depending on the get depending on the game that's being played, you are kind, you are kind of screwing over the experience of everybody else. It's a case of um, if you screw, if one, pr if if you end up be, if you end up being that anchor, you're dragging everyone else down in the in the name of your fun. It's not yeah, you're the. It's not just about your fun. Yeah, if if you do it poorly enough, if you don't count for, you know, the the necessary party cohesion, you become the millstone around everyone's neck. And again, just as no one likes being the spare wheel, no one likes being the whipping boy either. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as much as as much as I made Varric the whipping boy in the in the ninth world campaign, that was by that was by his own doing. <laughs> I just play I just played into it with a death by snoo snoo moment, and he pl and he played it and he played into it just as much. Because Death by Snoo <laughs> Well, his character, um, 
Varric was Mike's character during that, and mm -hmm. his uh, his character was a was a man whore. I'll put it that way. In another setting, he may have been a bard because he would try and sleep with any. There is not there is not a single race or sub race that he wouldn't try and sleep with. Ah, uh, that's a uh, one of those players. Got it. Um. Uh, there was there was no ma there was no magical realm or anything like that. He and it, and everybody pretty much knew about his bullshit. So yeah. So it's it's less of, it's less of it's less of D and more of and, and more the skirt chaser character you see in you see in plenty of anime. Or to put it another way, Lupin anytime he's with Fujiko. Yeah. Where the hell, where the hell is that where the hell was that boxing glove hiding all this time anyways? Don't answer that question viewers to borrow <laughs> from one of to borrow from one of my favorite let's players. Mm -hmm. But it is but being a but once again we come back to that theme of understanding your audience and learning to play and learning to play to them. Um, mm -hmm. I would be interested down the road, Tanner, I would be interested to talk with you about puzzles because that's one of those things that even more experienced GMs have trouble with. I'd say the I'd say the only game I can think of that put an emphasis on puzzles as a as a pill as a pillar of encounters is Mystic Empyrean. And one, that's a deep ass cut. Two, Mystic Empyrean is a very, very special case. I think the way that I've always done puzzles is uh, if they're optional, like a puzzle that leads to, you know, maybe some nice loot or something. Failure to solve the puzzle and instead, you know, find an alternative may lead to losing that extraneous option. You might cause that gold that you were just about to get to drop into a vat of aqua regia. Good job. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if it's something more intrinsic to story or plot, instead of making it an all-around fail state, even um, failing to interact with the puzzle and solve it in the way that it's involved uh, may not destroy the item that's needed. Then again, it might. You might lose that plot thread, and they, they're going to have to find it a different way. Um, but there are also maybe some additional goodies for solving the puzzle in the way it's intended, just as a as a sort of, hey, you know, you thought your way through it and found the right path. Here, have some extras. Mm -hmm. Even then, it's not a perfect it's not a perfect handling of a puzzle, but it's it suited me fine over the years. <laughs> But that brings us to the next part, crea um, creating purpose. <clears throat> Everything in an encounter needs to have a purpose. If a door is locked, why was it locked? If a group of creatures will, ha will, have, to th will have to the death without fleeing? We'll have to fight to the death without fleeing, I'm guessing. Let yeah. me write that in. Yeah, why, why will they do that? Assigning creatures, objects, and encounters purpose... Breathes life into them, and thus, in Heavens and Heresies, it is a requirement for making encounters. For creatures, they need a reason for being there, and they also need a point to, oh, need a point where they no longer want to be there. Describe two different dragons: one looking for food, and the one protecting its nest. Talk about how their purposes and goals are different. Most creatures have a flee slash ending scenario, something like that. If it occurs, they will stop fighting. For example, a group of goblins might have a flea scenario like like this. Half the group dies. Most creatures won't fight to the death, but on the other hand, if the adventurer stumble onto a bear's den and she's protecting her cubs, she'll fight to the death, but a good ending scenario for that encounter would be the characters leaving the den, since the bear will most likely stay to protect her young. Think of things like that for every encounter. It takes little time and makes encounters feel a lot more real. Alternatively, a mindless golem might fight to the death. It feels not fear and has no motivation save for the order of its master. But, most important, 
there is a narrative reason why it doesn't flee. Well, there's a simple solution to that. Break the control rod. Or write Emmet on its head instead of Met. Mm -hmm. Or no, cro cross out the E, so it is just Met and means death. Mm -hmm. For objects, if a chest is trapped, why is it trapped? It shouldn't be difficult to think of a reason, and having a reason will, pr will provide more fodder for the encounter slash adventure. If a door is locked, why is it locked? Who locked it? These questions aren't difficult to answer succinctly, and again, breathe life into a world. Right. I have to say this, because um, this, this sort of logic um, is what leaps out to me. Trapped chests, no matter what setting, no matter what uh, what reason they may be trapped. My thought is that if a chest is booby trapped, it's it's booby trapped for only three reasons. One, to catch the stupid. Because those are usually like the obvious chest out in the middle of nowhere. It's trapped and you turn to stone for what's basically an empty chest. Two, it's a decoy. It's trapped to make you think the real treasure is there, but once you disarm the trap and get inside, it's a note that says, ha <laughs> ha! Or three, it's the final layer of resistance. Or four, it's not a chest at all, it's a mimic. Those aren't trapped, Monk. They just bite your hand off. Oh, but you never know. Deck saves two fingers. Mm -hmm. You have to roll a d4 plus one to find out which two. Now... That being said, then we get to resolving encounters. Don't let them drag on. When is an encounter over? Write possible endings to the encounter. Be okay with those endings. That's why we have ending scenarios written into creatures. It helps make encounters end when they need to. But it's also clear that an encounter is no longer threatening a group. And this is a subjective call. Humans are better than mechanics at heuristics. Utilize that. You as GM should end the encounter and simply summarize the ending results. This is the same as the ability check mechanic. If the results either don't matter or are already predetermined, don't roll the dice. There is no point. Same thing here. If the fight is over, don't continue rolling dice for the fight. Just narrate the end. I have never been one of those people who think who thinks that encounters encounters only end when the enemy is completely out of hit points. Because that See, opens the door to artificially <coughs> lengthening things or... When it's very clear that there, that there's a that there's a massive advantage in the player's favor. Mm -hmm. When it's, it's clear that there's a huge advantage in the player's favor, but they're still rolling dice just to roll dice. Mm -hmm. I will admit, I've had some play groups that don't want the encounter to end until they're sure that every enemy is at zero HP. And sometimes that's boring for me. I'm like, guys. Guys, you are all level 8. This is three goblins. Why did you even roll to hit? Mm -hmm. I just, know some people might just... say, well, I, want, I wanted to see if I crit. I look at people like that, and I go, I'm just going to give you a dice rolling program, and you can laugh and giggle when big number's good. I have sometimes just wanted to do that to them. I can understand that. So, then we have the goal. Every encounter needs a goal slash point, or at least the actors within those encounters need a goal. For example, in an encounter where endless hordes of goblins swarm from the walls... Jeez, what is it with you and the endless hordes of goblins thing? Were you watching because Goblin he... Slayer when you wrote this? I mean, he might have been, but I think it's more the fact that he's trying to illustrate that an encounter is not all the point of an encounter is not always defeat all enemies mm -hmm. the goal for the players might be to escape to reach a certain safe point where the goblins will be effectively outrun 
The various goals are summarized below. It's not an exhaustive list, and sometimes encounters will be a combination of different goals or be able to be solved in different ways. Dev note, these are just some musings, nothing pinned down yet. The position attack stuff won't be set mechanics, but rather heuristics slash guidelines for talking about enemy actions. So the goal examples we have are flee, encounters where enemies pursue the party, enemies can position and attack, fight, encounters where enemies fight the party, again position and attack, or find, investigate is in this as well, whether it be finding an object or a information, encounters where the party is attempting to find something, enemies can something and something. <laughs> oh. Avoid slash sneak. Encounters where enemies are looking for the party. Enemies can position and investigate. These goals can be mixed in various ways, and the goals of an encounter can even change the cor can even change during the course of an encounter. For example, a group might begin to fight a dragon, only to realize the dragon is too strong, flee from it, and then attempt to avoid it until it forgets about them and loses track of them. Why am yes, I getting Monster dra Hunter flashbacks? T, if you're not, because there's there's a vital step missed there if they're going to flee or avoid a monster. They forgot to throw shit in its face. Literally. <laughs> Dung bombs! Well, if you're dealing with an enemy that has a strong sense of smell, that'd do it. Yep. It always drives the monster to another, uh, another sector in the game. I think that's also the reason why certain certain people in the military have sprays specifically f to f to um fuck with search dogs. <laughs> that's probably true. Mm -hmm. uh, then we go into other stuff. In general, an encounter should bring about half the party to zero hit points or the rough equivalent. Encounters are encounters because they are threatening. Eventually, I'll unify the threat encounter language. Today is not that day, though it draws ever closer. Um, I actually talked to Tanner about this when when he was talking about threatened uh, in other parts of the book. Um, encounters are encounters because they are threatening, like he just said there. Mm -hmm. um, when you are in an encounter, you are threatened, period. That's That's how that works. The only... Once you're at the point where you can, you know, narrate the end of the fight or narrate the end of the encounter, that's when the threat ends because you are narrating the end of that threat. Mm -hmm. But um, he he wants to eventually unify it so that it's all encounter, so it makes sense as part of the encounter. Yeah. Let's see. Then we have flee, also known as the French method, or bringing brave Sir Robin. Mm -hmm. In situations where characters must flee either because the number of enemies is endless <coughs> or because a fight has... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Wrong pipe. ...has turned sour, GM should create an, a scenario that, when achieved, will result in a successful retreat. A GM could create this scenario in advance or just as easily create it when the need arises, though if the encounter involves an endless horde of replenishing monsters then it stands to reason they should create a flea scenario beforehand. The scenario should always be represented in a goal and should always reflect decisions made by the players and need not be confined to a specific scenario. For example, if the group of players is being chased by goblins throughout a tunnel network, the GM might decide beforehand that if the group is able to escape into the sunlight, the goblins will stop chasing them, but the party might decide to, instead, break line of sight from the goblins, and then hide in a part of the cave system until the goblin horde loses track of them. In this latter example, the party, if successful, transfers from fleeing the goblin horde to avoiding them. In fleeing encounters, players take actions, utilizing initiative if necessary to avoid creatures and hindrances, including killing monsters that might be in their way, in order to achieve a scenario that will end the encounter. Scenarios might include getting to a specific point, which will require the party to utilize movement and positioning features, or hiding, changing the goal of the encounter from flee to avoid. The opposing party continues to pursue the players, utilizing whatever checks and active traits are available to them until the specified scenario has been met. 
I wonder if you could use flee in reverse when it comes to the party members pursuing. I am sure you could. Mm -hmm. That that wouldn't I I literally you just use the the uh, the actual mechanics in reverse. That that would make perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have fight. This is a fight. Each opposing side attempts to take actions to defeat the other until the encounter is over or the goal of the encounter changes. When designing encounters such as this, GMs should always give the opposing actors goals and specific states that, if reached, will cause the opposing party to flee or end the encounter. Very few creatures fight to the death and will begin to flee if it looks like they will lose the battle. For this reason, most, if not all, creatures should have a flee-slash-end scenario, something that, when triggered, will cause the creature to flee. Then we have avoid with... Well, Go ahead. I was about to say, going going back to the whole, was he watching Goblin Slayer during all of this? Mm -hmm. um, it's very clear that Goblin Slayer understands that last part about a flea end scenario. It's why he closed up an entire count, uh, an entire uh, uh, den of goblins, and set it all on fire so that none of them could escape and they would all die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. Then we have avoid. And it go, we go into levels of avoid, which are unaware, self-explanatory, observant, they have not seen the party but are on the lookout, curious, they have not seen the party but have been alerted to suspicious activity, aware, the creatures are aware of the party's existence and have a general idea of their location but are not actively searching for them, searching, the creatures are aware of the party's general location and are actively searching, and fixated, the creatures have direct line of... Sight. To the part to the party, or a good understanding of where the party is located, and is actively pursuing them. Um. Am I am I the only one getting Metal Gear flashbacks? Metal Gear. <laughs> Archon. Liquid. There you go. Yeah. My best David Hater impressions. <laughs> It could it could be worse. You could try to do a key a Kiefer Sutherland impression. Kiefer Sutherland can't even do a Kiefer Sutherland <laughs> impression. <laughs> brass, getting down to brass tacks. These are various levels of awareness in heavens and heresies. A GM chooses one that most accurately represents the situation. Player actions can move the scale up or down. I do hope that if you Tanner, if you ever make a GM screen for this, I do hope that you put the levels of avoid. On that, if you haven't or if you haven't made a custom screen that does that already, wouldn't be surprised. Tanner is quite detail oriented. Oh, uh, but then, then we ha then we have find is the opposite of avoid. It uses similar mechanics to avoid, just reversed. Because the party already has the goal to find the thing, they cannot become unaware of it. So, it's it only it's zero th it, instead of zero through five, it's one through five. But is more, but is not too far removed from uh, avoid. So then we have the actors in an encounter. Each encounter should have about as many opposing actors as there are party members plus one, so the players should generally start outnumbered. This is why there are different types of actors. Fodder, the groups of creatures you can automatically hit, really they're just there's a roadblock and a group of four or five of them, should be considered one actor and they share a stat block. Normal, this is the typical stat block for one creature. Large, these creatures have multiple parts like legs, head, and arms, all represented by a different stat block in order to make fighting large creatures like dragons more exciting. Unless an essential part of a creature is killed, like the head, defeated body parts are considered to be disabled so they cannot act once defeated. And elite, oh, so, oh, actually there's one more tier, so. These creatures have multiple, sometimes identical stat blocks, but each stat block takes a turn in the encounter. This is for big boss baddies who you want to make seem epic. They get full extra turns to position slash take actions rather than just legendary actions. 
sounds to me like a uh, any any boss monster with multiple HP slots or multiple HP bars. Um, looking at you and any character action game in the last twenty years. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and also uh, sounds to me like any fucking boss with triple action in Super Robot Wars Thirty. Oh my god, fucking god damn it! <laughs> you weren't even trying for a Super Robot Wars plug, and you did it anyways. Fuck off. <laughs> now you know how it feels. I've, I, I'm... Triple action is the bane of my existence. I mean, it isn't really. Like I said earlier before the, the, the show, Super Robot Wars is not that hard. But goddamn triple action bosses! Anyway, <laughs> and then we have Unique. Actors that have full PC stat blocks and features. Use these sparingly as they take a lot of often unnecessary time to set up. You can have the party fight a wizard by giving the elite archetype features from the wizard class rather than statting up a full character. Be economic with your time. Notice that this doesn't mean that each encounter should have multiple creatures, only that there should be more actors than there are party members. For example, if there were three party members, a fun combat encounter might be two groups of fodder creatures and one large creature with two parts. This would mean that there would be about 9 to 11 creatures, but only four moving parts of the encounter. Each actor is given a stat block, which has name of creature, res- um, resonance, proficiency, proficiency, stat type, hit points, movement, um, ability scores, <coughs> passive traits, active traits, and description. Those are, those are ability defenses. Mm-hmm. Ability defenses, my bad. Yeah. Uh, a typical stat... You, Go ahead. Even, it even says that down there later. I just noticed that. A typical stat block for a creature does not look like a player's stat block. It's unnecessary. It only contains what is necessary for the GM to know or relate to the player. Some things of note. A creature doesn't have ability scores, only ability defenses. A creature's proficiency is considered to act in place of the typical proficiency plus ability score setup that players players have. This is why creature proficiency scores tend to be a little bit higher than players since they incorporate what would be ability modifiers into them already. If a creature is particularly good or bad at something, it uses the advantage-disadvantage mechanic. For example, if a creature has bad eyesight, it would roll with its same proficiency bonus to try and see something but have disadvantage on the roll. Or if a player was trying to avoid that creature's detection, they would have advantage. It's that simple. It's possible to it's possible to make more. So then we start with the t- with the types, and of course the first one is fodder. Only one stat block is used to represent the entire group of creatures. Fodder creatures move and act as a group, and must take the same actions simultaneously. Thus, if one moves, they all move, and if one attacks, they all attack. The fodder creature's damage is for all of the creatures, not for each one. Fodder creatures have one hit point and no defenses. Whenever a creature chooses sorry, whenever a player chooses to attack one, the attack automatically hits and the creature dies. No roll required. Fodder creatures are fodder. Their danger is the fact that they eat up players' turns in the action economy and have to be dealt with. When the entire group of fodder monsters are alive, they make attacks with advantage. When at least one is missing, they make attacks normally. When more than half are missing, they make attacks with disadvantage. I'd say it's a good reason to keep mul- to keep multiple fodders on, on on the ground. Yeah, can help really mix things up. Mm-hmm. See, then we have general actors. General creatures are represented by a single stat block. Unlike fodder creatures, they have hit points and defenses. They follow the general rules for creatures and, like all stat blocks, have 1-3 to three active abilities maximum. This category is not only reserved for creatures, traps such as swinging blades from the ceiling, or darts that shoot, you, that shoot from the wall also count as an actor. It makes its turn, as normal, in the initiative and has defenses like a normal creature. For inanimate objects, they generally do not have mental defenses or movement and are, atta- are immune to attacks that would target a mental defense. Does that mean... The, would, would that mean that um, game journalists don't have mental defenses? Uh, 
Moving on. And we have Elite Actors. If a GM wants to give a creature more than three active abilities, they should create an elite creature, represented by two or more stat blocks. Generally, the defenses are the same between the various stat blocks, and they share a hit point pool, though it is multiplied for however many stat blocks there are in the encounter. This means that the creature takes multiple turns in the initiative order, if that is being tracked. This is intentional. It helps big bads feel big and bad. This is also where the GM might regulate specific encount in sorry, not encounter, environment effects caused by the big bad. They would be counted as active traits of the big bad and take a turn as normal. It's an interesting setup. It is. Mm -hmm. and then we have large actors. This type is misnamed and will probably have a different name later, but this is for creatures like dragons or eldritch abominations, which have multiple moving parts. Each moving part is represented by a stat block. So for dragons, they would have a head slash body, wings, legs, and tail, at least, each represented by a stat block. Unlike elite creatures, each stat block would have different could have different defenses or hit points, depending on the part, but like other all other creatures, each part of the creature has one to two active abilities maximum. This is to help large epic creatures feel large and epic. The dragon's wings move it around and launch the players away with a mighty thundering. The players scramble to get back into place, then the dragon rears its mighty head and lets out <laughs> its fiery breath, etc. When a part of the creature is reduced to zero hit points, it is removed from the initiative order. Many creatures will have a vital point that, when it is defeated, causes the rest of the creature to die as well. Creatures with a vital point are handled in the following way. They gain an increase to their defenses, usually an increase of one, for each non-vital point that is active, and they gain two damage reduction for each non-vital point that is active. Thus, the players have to play risk-reward to decide what they should do. <coughs> See, and then we have environmental effects. Some actors don't fit into the above classifications. Environmental effects, for example, have active traits but generally don't have hit points, though a howling wind will make an attack against its character's strength, so it still has a proficiency in an active trait. They are represented as a general creature without hit points or defenses, and count as an actor, since they act every turn. If the environmental effects impedes both groups, the players and their enemies, it does not count as an actor. In addition, terrain, either advant advantageous or disadvantageous, can grant general benefits or detriments to creatures, and can count as an actor as well. Terrain is explained in more detail below. Eventually, there will be more in-depth in, in more in-depth sections statting out certain environmental effects and how they work. Then we have unique actors. This is another special class of creature that a GM should rarely, if ever, use. These creatures are reserved for special NPCs, which the GM wishes to act more like a PC. Rather than using the stat block, these creatures are formed in the same way that a player character is. A GM should use this method sparingly, if at all. It is time-consuming and generally does not make for a fun game or situation. In addition, if the party faces a creature such as this, a GM should reconstruct this creature as an elite creature and follow the rules for such creatures, as this will make the encounter more dynamic and interesting. Let's see, and then we have defense arrays for creatures based on tier. Different defenses based on their tier, and then we have a list of the following arrays. Rain, um, venturing from comp, the, using the four, the same five tier setup that we've seen in the past, yep. and divided between balanced offset and max min, and then other stats based on tier, basically proficiency bonus, hit points, and movement. Yeah. Again, separated by tier. Then we have active tra active traits. Only two maximum active traits should ever be applied to a stat block. Active traits are, th are things which creatures must utilize their action in order to do. Creatures can always do things that any normal creature would be able to do, make ability checks and the like. But active traits are special things they can do specific to encounters. The most common forms active traits take are attacks. And I do like that there is a average damage setup here. 
which um, kind of reminds me of that of that, da of that damage scaling thing that we had to go into turbo nerd levels of ma levels of math for our own project. <laughs> That's true. Oh, for attacks that do more than just damage, a GM should follow in general the following rules. A GM should use weapons in the equipment section for the purposes of determining the damage's dice type and the range of the attack, as well as other properties like the increased threat range of axes. A GM can also trade in a damage dice in order to choose a secondary effect for the attack, using the spells as guidelines. For example, the GM could trade in one dice of damage for an uncommon monster to have the attack also push a creature 10 feet from the wind spell. GMs should always give at least half of the creatures in an encounter an effect that does more than just damage. Most encounters should have active traits that will knock the players back, allow the enemy to reposition, or otherwise keep the fight dynamic. GMs should not create a plethora of encounters where the party <coughs> and enemies sit in their respective tradition, petition, ah, positions English monk, and trade attacks. That is not how Heavens and Heresies encounters are meant to work. This emphasis on movement, I'm pretty sure, is going to make some people cry foul about 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 um br about bringing in the fort, bringing in the um four e boogeyman. But to that, I say, fuck them. Uh, boogeymen are always either worse than stated or better. So, but there was a there was a lot of movement rules when it came to four e, and a lot of movement effects whether it be force movement or the importance of shifts or the like. And huh. a lot of people try to say that because of that, 4th edition is less of a role-playing game and more of a... Um, more of a te more of a tactical board game. Yeah. You know, because it's not, it's not like it's not like they're dealing with a game that's, that's been very combat-heavy since day one. No, not at all. Let's see, dev note. All of this will be described in more depth in the final product, of course. There will also be a list of active <sighs> traits that do not fit the weapon spell setup. You can also equip them with shields and whatnot for bonus defenses if they are using a one-handed weapon. So then we have passive traits. Passive traits help round out the creature and make it interesting. A creature generally has a number of passive traits depending on its tier. So it's 1 to 2 for common and uncommon, 2 to 3 for rare, 3 to 4 for very rare, and 5 to 6 for legendary. A creature can have more or less passive traits, or none at all, but a GM should keep in mind that this will change the difficulty of a creature. Passive traits can be general increases to stats like these. Plus 1 to proficiency, plus 5 feet of movement, another movement type equal to a creature's normal movement, minus 10 feet, or they could switch around and have the creature swim faster than they can walk, etc. Things like breathing underwater should be considered part of the same passive trait. Plus 5 or plus 10 HP. Probably plus 5 for common and uncommon, but plus 10 for rare and maybe plus 15 for very rare and plus 20 for legendary. Which, given the way HP is distributed in this game, plus 20 HP is nothing to sneeze it's at. Huge. It's huge. <laughs> For a legendary creature, that's going to be... I mean, legendary creatures are already at a base of 90 in the uh, blocks above, so that's that's a that's more than any player character will likely get without, you know, some additional features and feats from classes and such. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Damage reduction starting at 2 and going up by 1 for each tier above common. Damage resistances, plus 2 to a, diff to a certain defense. In general, a defense should not be increased by more than four unless it's a defense that is already lower. Regeneration. Creature regenerates HP equal to tier times five. Doesn't sound like... Question he's mark. Doesn't sound like he's 100% confident in that. Well, I mean, think, think of it. If, if, you're, if you're fighting a legendary monster, that's tier five. Five times five is 25 HP per turn. That's, that's insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's like asking to have a never-ending fight. Yeah. Let's see. Life leech gains. Increased reach plus 5 or 10 feet of reach for attacks. Or can stay in a creature's own square enveloping them. Advantage on AOO.
See, and then we have the terrain of an encounter. Terrain is important for determining the difficulty of an encounter. Is there cover for the ambushing creatures? Can they safely retreat if they are threatened? Is there a mass of hindering terrain between them and the party? These factors can greatly increase or decrease the difficulty of an encounter. Terrain that is advantageous for the opposing actors counts as having plus one actors. Terrain that is neutral for either party counts as have... Let me fix that. Having plus zero actors. Terrain that is disadvantageous for the opposing actors counts as having minus one actors. Things that count as advantageous terrain. Things that provide cover or protect. Things that hinder the opposing party. Things that allow for easier movement slash positioning. Things that count the as disadvantageous terrain. Just the opposite of advantageous terrain. No, really? <laughs> it's not like they're antonyms or anything! The rules here are light because they should be. These determinations are subjectives but are here to inform a GM that they should be considered when making an encounter. A horde of goblin archers is more difficult to face when they have cover in the surrounding canyon and an easy escape route. If There's the, players, the goblins again. If the players must scale a cliff face to even engage with their foes, the terrain is advantageous to their enemies. When creating terrain for an encounter, a GM should always design terrain that is meant to engage the players. Rooftops to climb, trees to hide in, corners to use for cover, etc. If someone in the party is an expert climber, the GM should, not always of course, include terrain that can be climbed or if an actor can breathe underwater. A well-placed well or stream makes for a wonderful ambush location. The point here is that terrain is essential to every encounter in Heavens and Heresies, and a GM should always give thought to how the terrain will allow for player interaction and how it will affect difficulty of an encounter. Eventually there will be sample maps with terrain and explanations here to give examples of favorable and unfavorable terrain in, the, in an encounter. Then we get to harvesting materials from monsters and resource nodes, which we've kind of touched upon, and this is where the um, ranger shines more than the other classes. Imagine mm -hmm. saying that. Imagine saying that about about five E core. Uh, when a monster is slain or a resource node is found, players can harvest them. The GM determines which types of materials are appropriate for any given monster or resource node, and the tier of the harvest materials is dependent on the tier of encounter or area. The number of materials players may harvest from an encounter is dependent on the difficulty of that particular encounter or area within its particular tier. While this might seem like a metagame mechanic, it fits into the narrative fluidly. The largest deposits of resources are often the most heavily guarded or the most difficult to reach. Otherwise, they would have been ar already harvested. And then we have the tier of encounter slash material based on the player level or the par or the party character level. Then the number of actors, the relative difficulty, and th and then the um, harvestable materials. So yep. if, it's, if it's minus one, then inconsequential material, only one harvestable. Whereas if it's party size plus four, the encounter is nigh impossible and has four harvestable materials. Well, if it's party size minus one, Monk, it's inconsequential and zero harvestable materials there. Yeah. It was so easy, you didn't get anything from it. Mm -hmm. The number of harvestable materials one gets from an encounter is measured before things like terrain advantage are calculated into the encounter. Relative difficulty assumes the players are fighting something at their current tier. For each tier above and below, the scale moves in the appropriate direction by two. This, thus, an encounter where a group is or a group of four level three characters fight three uncommon creatures on neutral terrain would be considered a moderately difficult encounter. GMs should also keep track of the party's character level within their respective bracket. In Heavens and Heresies, powerful, often game-changing features are given at the end of the shifts in tier, but a group of level 4 adventurers will have more resources than a group of level 1s, and a GM should account for this either in terms of terrain or in terms of how many passive abilities are given to the opposing actors. 
Which... Yeah, I mean, when we went through all the class documents, powerful, often game-changing features, nah! No, that's not that's not any of the classes at all! No! It's not like you had a thing of saying what the fuck in a positive manner every week. No, that wasn't a running gag. Never. Let's see, and then we go <laughs> then we go with challenging the party, strengths and weaknesses by class. This section aims to, in a preliminary way, tell you, the GM, what each class excels at and what each class is limited by. Each encounter should generally have a mix of both, allowing various characters to shine or be challenged throughout the course of an adventure. So then we we have we don't have all of them, but we have a f we have a few of them to get the idea. I know the reason we don't have all of them. Barbarians tend to excel in combat scenarios. Specifically, they excel at defeating large groups of enemies. In combat, they are strong against enemies who deal small amounts of damage multiple times and are weaker against enemies who deal large amounts of damage in a single hit. Unless you're a blood barbarian, <laughs> in which case, if I'm going to die, you're going with me. Mm -hmm. Then we have Disciple. Disciples are fluid both in and outside of combat encounters. They are able to move and react fluidly, making them shine in encounters where there are many things that need to be handled. Because the Disciple is so fluid, specialized tasks tend to be harder for them. Druids are able to cast spells without expending resources. This makes them adept at handling long-lasting encounters, since their spells tend to be weaker than those who utilize resources. They, they are less effective in short, deadly encounters. Fighter, the fighter excels at tactically moving through combat encounters. While they themselves are not as strong as a barbarian, they are able to grant the party extra abilities within combat encounters, making them exceptional. Fighters rely on their party to be effective. Encounters that isolate them from their group tend to be difficult for them. I mean, that last sentence could be said about anybody, though. He did, he did make a point that there, were, there was... Trying to be the one-man army type hero is not going to work in this system. Yeah, I think I think the reason it's highlighted in the fighter is because of how warlordy the fighter is. Yeah, with the with the with the move attack and rally commands alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we have herald. The herald excels at bolstering their allies. They tend to be flexible both in and outside of threatening encounters. Because they focus on bolstering their allies, they like the fighter can have a difficult time on their own. And we st we started with the Inquisitor it excels at finding information and detecting threats, but then it it stops mid sentence, so I'm skipping over that. And the remaining ones don't have their descriptions in just yet. See, I told you I know the reason why it just stops. An Inquisitor would never let anyone tell them tell their weaknesses. <laughs> if that ends up being the in if that ends up being a fourth wall break in the final book, I blame you. Um, it, you should blame me, and Tanner, you can take it if you'd like. It'd better be the cheeky rogue that says it, though. <laughs> uh, and we have setting up an encounter, Again, just as a let's review. Over -enco overall encounter purpose should directly interact or interfere with player goals. Main actors, purpose slash goal of main actors, general environment things of note for specific players, and projected and potential ends to the encounter. And we have sample encounters, which will have a number of example encounters which can be modified or used, like a bestiary, but for encounters rather than specific creatures. It will also give tables and such to give the EGM ideas for encounters. Then we have adventures, a collection of encounters tied together by concise narrative, Remember when the game f forced you to have a reason why things existed? It was to make this step easier, also to make the game feel alive. This will be a cohesive explanation on how to put adventures together utilizing a string of encounters. How time is tracked will be included in every section from encounters to adventures to campaigns. And we have exploration and travel, a guide on how Heavens and Heresies handles exploration and travel, adapted from Angry since it's the best way. Then we have Campaign. Campaigns are a collection of adventures tied together by an overarching narrative. This will have an equal amount of stuff as adventures and encounters eventually. This section will provide simple campaign ideas, large overarching 
themes which can be used to tie together a number of what would otherwise be independent adventures. Things like war, famines, strange magical happenings across the world, etc., etc. And the elves. Horsemen? The horsemen? <laughs> what? War? Famine? Pestilence? Death? I don't feel like I don't feel like breaking out my copy of Dark Siders today. It's strife in that one, not pestilence. Mm -hmm. But the original four horsemen are war, famine, pestilence, and death. And if you listen close, you can say you can hear <coughs> people say, "I thought the I thought the four horsemen were ah were Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, and I'm killing this joke right now." <laughs> I mean, if we want to go even more meta, Monk, we could say, I thought the four horsemen were uh, Ubisoft Activision. <laughs> you can't I can't. I couldn't. <laughs> Let's see, then we have rewards and progression. Although a lot of rewards and progression are automated, other things like magic items are not. This section will have guides and tables and charts, as well as sample magic items that can be added to the loot of a game to make it more exciting. Also to emphasize, magic items are part of the game. They are not just an afterthought, so the expectation is that they will be in the game. Otherwise, intuition is relatively useless stat, and that's not cool. And this section will detail that. Sec we'll also detail it more in-depth in how XP works, though that too is automated. Players get 1 XP for a day's worth of encounters. They get XP each time they fulfill a goal, which can be set by them and okayed by the GM, or set by the GM. For example, a player might set a goal to raise a warband in order to stave off the impending Silwari Raiders. This section will help the GM break down this larger goal into manageable chunks, each worth 1 XP. When it comes to that whole when it comes to that whole manageable chunks thing, um, Tanner, a bit of advice. Steal from Cortex. <laughs> Specifically Marvel Heroic or maybe Cortex Prime. And if and if it, and um if you can if you have a hard time finding finding a copy, don't wor don't worry. Because just because Marvel wants the thing to be forgotten doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that the internet will. Anyway, the for goals set, internet never forgets. Yeah, for goals set by the GM, the players can be aware of some of these goals and not aware of others. For example, players hired to save the Duke's daughter know that it is one of their goals. They get XP if they achieve it and no XP if they don't. But another goal which the GM might keep hidden might be to rescue her before the ritual to bind her to an abyssal being a ritual with the, which the Duke doesn't know about, so neither would the players, occurs. Players would get an additional XP if they fulfilled this goal. And then lastly, we have not a thing on non-player characters, which will be a section about how to run NPCs since they're, so they're believable and not cringeworthy. Follows the, follows the same thing as encounters, give them goals and such. Have them try and achieve these goals, etc. Also, for the general power level of an unmarked soul, GMs can refer, can refer to the Ancestries. Unmarked souls can still gain levels as they gain experience, but just don't have a class associated with that level. Only what they would get from their Ancestry slash background. Isn't that neat? Considering it's only the unmarked souls that get classes, or the marked souls that get classes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and that pretty much covers ev covers everything we have so far regarding heavens and heresies now before we get to final thoughts i i think we should speak a bit on the encounterary um this partic the encounterary as we see it right now is more of an outline for what's planned more than anything else yeah but even but, even well, with that i do like the direction that it takes yeah it's it's uh functional and it's clear that when it's fleshed out a little bit further it's it's still going to be based more on function than anything and it's all modular mm -hmm. i think that's the best what that's the best part about it is that it's all modular that modular nature actually helps with uh making it easier to build inside the sandbox <clears throat> mm -hmm. and from the 
from what we've read in the past, I know that he said that, that uh, everything in the book is assuming Mirari as the setting, which, you know, good on him having no implied setting, but, you know, sticking to his, sticking to an actual setting. But it's very clear that you could still have and use this outside of the Mirari setting um, and use it in basically other high fantasy settings where there's a lot of magic because uh, magic is, <laughs> as we saw from the feats last week, you can basically give anyone a spell if you want to. <laughs> And so it's a, uh, you know, it's it's going to be a fantastic uh, sandbox to work within, even if you're not working within the setting. Very much, I'd say, I'd say very much so. And the other, th the other thing that I could, there, there's a couple. I like the I like the fact that there is a structure given, because when when I look at when I look at certain games as monster manuals, there's not really a structure to build around when it comes to encounters. It's just a case of, oh, this is what I thought was neat, so I'll just I'll just throw a bunch of things into the pot. This is especially I wonder if that I wonder if that's the reason why D and D has n has never done a monster creator um, section. A pro a proper monster creator section. I know fans have done have done it on some cases, but that does but for the purposes of this, that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but want, I can't help but think that the reason why they why they don't is they'd have to they'd have to admit the fact that there is no structure. Yeah. Which if you're do if you're doing a rules like game and you're not and you're having a very loose structure, I'm fine with that. But when, but where but this is not a rules like game. Even OSR games aren't exactly rules light. Yeah, uh, I mean, but this isn't really rules heavy either. No, but it's but it's not, but but it's. But it's not like. But it still goes. It still goes far enough into the crunch where that where that sort of hand waviness you can't really get away with. Yeah, it's it's not. It is very clearly in between the super crunch and the super narrativist game uh, ends. It's 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 in the nice middle. Yeah. That be that being said, I. There, there's a couple, of, there's a couple of things that I'm, cu I'm curious, how, I'm curious how they're going to be, how they're going to be handled. One of them is, I think, further on, we need to see a few examples of, build, of actually building different levels of encounters so that people can see how that works. Not a full bestiary, but just showing examples on how a given encounter might be built as a whole. Mm -hmm. And if you have to use the horde of goblins thing again, that'd be the place to do it. I can I can make some inferences from what we have, but having something concrete is always going to beat my own inferences. That be that being said, I eh, the thing that I can't help but notice is that the encounterer setup is very clearly made to be to have um stru to have structured encounters. I'm curious how you would handle the how this game would handle the idea of encounter tables, which is probably something that would be in the in the Mirari guide, mm -hmm. and how it would handle um, hex crawls. I know that hex crawls aren't exactly a popular gameplay style with with uh, more recent additions, but they are a style that people will play. I. I remember him saying that um, rest slash push forward opportunities are not on a specific timer, and that depending on the time scale of the game uh, you were playing, you know whether it's a uh, you're traveling over a, a week over land and thus you have to uh, account for that, and maybe your rest periods are once per day, or maybe you're inside a dungeon. 
your rest periods are like 10 minutes. <clears throat> um, I think that because the rest slash push forward opportunities are not tied to a specific uh, time period, like short and long rest is in 5e, um, you could very easily accommodate something like a hex crawl or a dungeon crawl. Mm hmm. It would just, you'd have to plan it out a little. Since you're making a hex crawl, you'd likely have to plan out some encounters that you can just plug and play as you need. Mm -hmm. Huh. Now, taking that, taking that into account, taking, taking all that into account, I think this is as good as the time as any to give, to give our wrap up and, and conclusion thoughts on okay. heavens and heresies um i find it i find it kind of amusing that a one man job has met, has managed to solve problems that entire teams at in at certain studios in seattle couldn't figure out yeah <laughs> um <laughs> i i find it i find it uh not only impressive, but just uh, it's it's slightly amazing to see how many. Um, I guess the best way is is uh, innovative ways, things that he took took old old ideas and revamped them in ways that are just much more engaging. <laughs> I'm also, you know, I like that we took this project on as a as a contrast to level up 5e. Mm -hmm. Um and oh my god. Uh contrast people, y you know what contrast means to measure one thing against another and see the differences. Well, uh as I've probably said more than enough times during this whole thing, night and fucking day. Yeah. Now, is it fair of me to compare one thing that's an early access with an, with something else that has that is now released, even though it wasn't released at the time that we were planning this? Truth, be, if I have to be really pedantic about it, no, it is not fair. However, at the time I discovered both of these projects, they were both in early access slash playtest or in some version of unreleased, and. I remember I remember when I had the positive reception to doing the fir to doing that first interview with Tanner. And that's when that and then I started looking deeper into Heavens and Heresies and I decided, you know what, maybe you know what, maybe this will be worth it to do a contrast much like we did with Magpie Avatar and Legend of the Elements. Yep. Which I know some people want there are some people who wanted me to use um the Avatar Second Age project that uses the Genesis system. I specifically chose Legend of the Elements in that case because I wanted to make clear that you can that you can do that Avatar can be done in Powered by the Apocalypse. That their choice of system wasn't my problem. The problem was the method. Yeah, it was always about how uh, it was application rather than the tools they were using. And in this particular case. The reason why I wanted to make the comparison between Level Up 5e and Heavens and Heresies is because both of them are responses, in one way or another, to Vanilla 5e. Whether it be, and I had I had said I had said that these kind of things were going that these kind of system overhauls were going to be inevitable, because we we've seen this thing we've we've seen this thing with Fourth Edition. With think with things like Strike, Unchained Heroes, and Thirteenth Age, and Unity, Third Edition with things like Spycraft, fa Fantasy Craft, and so on. No, I'm not, count I'm not counting Pathfinder in this. But I, I mean, Pathfinder it. was a response. You you kind of have to count it. It was a response, a not all that Never impressive said it. response. Well, neither was the, the neither was the Magpie Games. Use of power by the apocalypse for Avatar, but we counted it here. 
yeah, if I ha if I have to be fair, I gotta use it. But there is also the f there is also the fact that um a that with with stuff with stuff like pre uh, Wizards of the Coast era D and D, you have you have plenty of hacks and overhauls of the of those systems all throughout the OSR. Some of some of them really good, and some of them just kind of meh. Mostly, be, mostly because they have the systems as gospel a attitudes, and some of them are some of them are just, um, say BX with a coat of paint. Which, <laughs> and no, I'm not I'm not putting stars slash worlds without number in that. That is actually good. It's a it's a little un it's a little unforgiving, but it is good. Then again, one of his, then again with stars without number, one of the inspirations is Traveler, so I guess it fits. <laughs> uh, Traveler, the game where you die during character creation. Mm -hmm. Now, given that, given that there's a there are there's a few things when it comes to the core mechanics, not 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 any of the. Not any of the cr of the crazy ass stuff we saw later on in the documents, but just the core mechanics that I find very interesting. First of all, the ho dropping dropping the idea of armor class and instead going with ability defenses, which is something that Vanilla Five E seemed to want to do early early on, but they just but they just reflavored that into the new ability scores. Yeah, the ability score different. Uh... How each of them has their own save check now. Yeah. Whereas, th whereas this particular take on on ability defenses, if I'm being honest, this feels like a natural evolution to what I saw in Fourth Edition and Star Wars Saga. Okay, I can see that. Because in both of, in both of those, um, AC and the three saving throws were defenses, and attacks would and attacks would target different ones. I I have to bring I have to bring both up because while a lot of people saw this in 4E, it technically started in Star Wars Saga, which is very underrated in my opinion. Now, the other I'd say the other thing is the co is the combat focus mechanic, the whole idea of miss enough times and you'll be able to roll with advantage. Yeah. Which I find I find to be. I find, I find to be a great w a great way of um fa of fa of actually putting mechanics for failing forward. Failing forward is a is a philosophy that I enjoy, but I can't deny the fact that a lot of failing forward is dependent on narrative, not on mechanics. There yeah, are some exceptions, but for the most part, fail forward is more of a description thing. Mm hmm. Um. I'd also be remiss if I didn't if I didn't point out that I prefer I prefer the proficiency and expertise setup here because of the fact that getting what getting a single degree getting a, getting degrees of expertise tiers of expertise actually has a much bigger impact than just more than just more numbers. And just to just to refresh my memory. Actually, what am I saying? I got I got it over here. <laughs> this is, this is the look? moment where I for, this is the moment where I forget that I'm looking at both my PC and my laptop at the same time. The moment where you forget you have multiple screens. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Now I just have to now I just have to wait for the thing to load. But let's see. Ultimately, um, with the with the core mechanics, um, I've I like how everything is to the point where it serves an actual purpose instead of just something to roll for, so that you have something to roll for. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I can think of a few things where it's like why bother rolling 
in a in a lot of D and D five E. Um, <laughs> I can. I, I also really like. Um, I think my favorite thing about the core mechanics is the part with the conditions and the wounds and the curses. Yeah, I'd say the only other game I can think of that put that much effort into conditions in that regard. And I'm not I'm not counting something like fi something something like fate because it because the conditions or or aspects are just are just one in the same, so it's not really so it it's not really mm -hmm. sticking that much. But mm -hmm. the closest analog I can think of is the condition ladders in wine. What's old is new. Yeah. And while these and while this isn't going for exactly the same thing, it is trying to go for a sca for scaling effects when it comes to conditions and putting an emphasis on utilizing those conditions. Because a lot of a lot of times positive and negative conditions seem kind of inconsequential in games. Um and I think the the point here, the 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 fact that this even goes further beyond um, how conditions can become wounds in under certain specific uh, you know situations, and are thus something carried with you from encounter to encounter without specific treatment, mm -hmm. or uh, how there are curses that can be inflicted upon you using the malediction ritual um that leave you with a more permanent affliction of some sort or another um, a condition that that is hampering you the the idea of making conditions like that last beyond an encounter um in a fundamental and uh impactful way is great i love it mm-hmm like I said, probably my favorite part about the core mechanics. Yeah, and of course, when we get to, if one were to compare the class design for either, for for both of them, <laughs> it's really not it's really not <laughs> that's that much of a comparison. <laughs> monk, monk. There, there isn't a class I don't want to play here. Which is it, saying something because I'd say th I'd say there's a fair few classes in no, in in vanilla that is that is a case of I ain't touching that shit. Ranger. No one touches the most snake bitten class. Fuck that shit. Ranger, wizard. Yeah, wizard would never touch a w the two things the the two or three things I was most interested in playing. And it's not because of uh, Cowzilla, um, but just because the range of options I get to interact with the game world. Uh, obviously, Cleric and Warlock, which we have in the form of the Vessel here. Um, but then I also liked to play around with Sorcerer. I, w I, I also wasn't ever really super interested in any of the martial classes in Base 5e. The closest I I got was playing a warforged barbarian, um, and we explained rage as a super mode instead of going, you know, bloodlusting, you know, instead of a, instead of this the like you know the 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 mindless rage or the or even some of the more focused rages of a barbarian, overclock. we had to flavor, yeah, we had to flavor it as some sort of warforge overclock. Um, we were all getting back into Gundam 00 at the time, so we named it Trans Am. <laughs> because weaves, you're not supposed to use anime in your D and D's. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good times. I had some. I had somebody who just wanted to, who wanted a speed based rage just so that they can use clock up. <laughs> You're not supposed to use Toku in your DNGs again. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think the other th the other thing is that is the actual relevant the fact that um, ancest ancestors and backgrounds have it have a degree of actual mattering. Yeah. 
Well, there, well, there are certain, there are certainly some subtypes and some gift and some um, paragon gifts in level up. The actual, Im the actual impact once you get to higher levels is still not that impactful. There's still, there was still the problem of races not mattering all that much once you're at one. I'd say one, I'd say once you're, once you're um close, once you were closer to tenth level, it didn't, re or even just at third level, your class started to matter more than your race. Mm hmm. Which is which is a problem that's ha that's happened for quite a while. I will I will admit. And a lot a lot of times race only matters in a narrative sense. Like if somebody chooses to if somebody chooses to be a human fighter or a dwarven fighter, um, how much how much impact does the does that racial choice really end up having? Um, extra times. HP, maybe? Good, whoopee, more numbers. Yeah, it's not a not a big impact. It's usually... It's usually appeals to the min-maxers. That's really it. Yeah. And when you think, when you think about it, the two... A... 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 A dwarven, a dwarven fighter and a hu and a human fighter. Even if they're even if they're both in ar even if they're both in armor doing sword and board, they shouldn't be fighting the same. They have di they have there's different fighting cultures within that to account yes. for their different builds. Yes. That's the reason why you don't why you're not going to see dwarves wielding swords all that often in fiction. Hey. Again, to answer the question that nobody, or well, that everybody seems to ask, dwarves live underground. Why are they using pick axes instead of pickaxes? Elves live in trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as far as far as the um, for me the I had always gone with the other reason is to get more is to get more power out of less space. That too. You no, know, because a, a an axe is not going to have its weight evenly distributed. If you follow me. Oh no, um, axes work very much on the idea of fulcrums and wedges. Mm -hmm. And to th and f in the, whereas because of the because of the starting abilities and then the and then the bonus feats that you end up getting. You're not really gonna have you're not really gonna have that issue here, and especially since you're you have that whole thing with starting ability scores, defenses, and fortitude and focus. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't point if we didn't point out the difference between hit dice and vitality. Yeah, H HP, willpower, and vi and vitality are three different things. Mm -hmm. Now, will willpower is willpower is not that far removed from the from the um, strikes when it comes to when it comes to failed saves when you're at zero. It's just one that's just a, in a system that makes more sense and isn't as arbitrary. Makes more sense, isn't as arbitrary, and is another resource you can potentially spend. Yeah. Whereas with eight with um, HP, and more import more importantly with hit with the way hit dice works with vitality. Works again, worse compared to vitality. I've I've made it clear. An argument that I've heard for years is that hit dice is five E's answer to healing surges. Or, or or say recoveries in thirteenth age. In that regard, recoveries are more of an answer to healing surges than hit dice are in in five E. And the prop the reason for that is the is the fact that. The purpose of hit dice was to was to make it so that everybody had some means of recovery. It, it's a limited form of recovery, but they still had access to it. Hit dice doesn't really do this until you get into the higher levels, where you get stoop, where your hit dice is stupid high. Yeah, it's not really super impactful. And even at, stuff, at first, mm -hmm. 
Whereas the approach with this one, if you d if you dump the maximum amount of vita amount of um, vitality, just as a starting character, you're gonna get that back. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get mo you're you're gonna get the amount of hit points that you that you, you're gonna get your, probably your max hit points back. And if you're one of the more martial characters, you're gonna be able to do that and probably get most of your vit get most of your vitality back. You're just going to notch one. One point off of the top. Uh huh. So it's not. Th martial characters don't get infinite vitality, but they're able to use. But they're able to use vitality more efficiently. Not to mention that you know during an actual rest, you recover a lot of things. Mm -hmm. If you're not pushing forward, you actually recover quite a bit. Mm hmm. And that re that really brings me. Th it's for the, it's for these kind of reasons that I do consider heavens and heresies to follow through on the idea of a advance or e or even even just a five point five of um, fifth edition. Large. I honest. <laughs> largely because it's take it's taking what didn't work and try and make and try and make it work. Yeah, I on I honestly think that a. Uh... Comparing it to fifth is kind of an insult to heavens and heresies. It it in all technicality it is, but since the since a lot of it was born from frustrations in running five e campaigns, I think it's warranted. Yeah, I I think uh, it's warranted to say this was born from five e. Why you so bad? I can do better. And it did use some DNA from that. Yeah, I can cert I can certainly say that I'd rather that I'd rather play this than the inevitable sixth edition because I know inevitable that I know that, that I know that that's coming. Please, why do you why do you say things that are terrible? Because because my vows require me to speak the truth. I mean. You also could have used your classic, but I guess you're trying to uh, diversify. Trying. Whether, <laughs> I'm whether I'm succeeding is debatable. But with all, but with all that said, I think I think we've made our point clear. And further, and as an aside, I will be I will be doing a vi I will be doing a video down the road. Summarize summarizing some of the differences between between the two, even though there's some things that don't have a parallel that I can use. But it's gonna but it's gonna be a while before that before that's finished. I don't even have the I don't even have the script finished for it because it's go it's going to take a bit of time. Plus, I've been working on writing with regarding the FF Legend project, which we've been making some headway on. Yep. And while this is the end of our assessment of Heavens and Heresies, this is not quite the end of uh, of um, Heavens and Heresies on this channel. Because now I can't promise that it'll be up on it'll be up on the same day, but on the sixteenth, I will be joined by Z I'll be joined by Zan, and we are we we will be players for once, which is a rare thing for us forever DMs. Yep. For a one shot of Heavens and Heresies that's going to be run by Tanner. And in that particular thing, it is going it is going to be half of it is going to be character creation and the other half is going to be the actual adventure. We are doing first levels. I'm pretty sure Zan is gonna has dibs on Inquisitor. Mine all mine <laughs> And We'll see. We'll see how th we'll see how things pl how things play out when the time comes, and we'll pr we'll probably have a few more a few more things to say once we d once we get our hands dirty with the thing. Now this does mean that I have to go back to using roll twenty for this, but I'm willing to bear that. I still have a roll twenty account. I might have to dust it off. So, so do I. It's prob it's probably been b it's probably been bumped off a of premium by now, but I still have it. I never paid for it, so I was never there. I had to DM for a few years, so I had to pay. Oof. 
especially since I'm not run especially since I'm not a one system guy. Mm -hmm. But with all that with all that said, next week we will be we will be um can we'll be doing a new season of Heavens and Heresies. Utilizing a game that I've that I've interviewed the creator of in the past, known as Veil of the Void, because after after doing two D twenty adjacent games back to back, we need to mix things up a little bit. Yeah, I I could use something non D twenty adjacent. Yeah. Also, um, on Tuesday night I will be putting up a value that we'll be putting up a value that judged. Regarding the quick start rulebook for Tidebreaker, which again is one is another one that I've another one that I've covered in the past through the many many interviews, but that is a story for another day. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>